Have you ever thought to wonder what would be said when the minister is delivering your funeral service? Well, with that in mind, we realize life is short, death is sure, eternity is wrong, so don't be wrong. I want to draw your attention to the superscription before verse number 1. It's interesting, you know, when we come to the book of Psalms, we just automatically assume in our American culture that Psalm number 1 was the first psalm that was ever written. But to the contrary, we get all the way to Psalm 90, and we see that in Psalm 90, the Holy Spirit of God lets us in on a secret to the background of this psalm, and it says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Did you know that according to the entire book of Psalms, because of this phrase right here, we believe that this psalm was the oldest psalm ever written in history. And as Moses, the man of God, is writing down these words, he's praying to God. Now, have you ever heard of Moses? I'm sure you have. If you're here on a Wednesday night, I'm certain that you know who Moses was. But remember back in the book of Exodus, Moses was, was a Hebrew. And his mama and daddy uh, took him and they put him in a basket and put him in a river. And then the Egyptians found him and he was raised in an Egyptian home. And time goes on in Moses' life and, and he becomes a mighty one and used of God in many great ways, but in Exodus chapter 3 we find he's standing in the desert on the backside of the desert and he looks and sees a bush burning but it does not consume by the fire. And that's when Moses is called of God to do great things. We find that throughout the book of Exodus Moses is the man that God calls along with Aaron to walk into Pharaoh's palace and say let my people go. And time and time again, Pharaoh refused to, to let the Israelites leave the land. Then we find that as they're leaving the land, Pharaoh finally gives in and says, you can finally go get out of here. And they walk up to the Red Sea. Moses lift his, lifts up his uh, rod and his arm. And God sends a strong east wind. And the Red Sea's part of the, the nation of Israel, along with Moses, walk across that land. And listen, commentators estimate that there was over a million people, perhaps, that during that time period. Just imagine a million people walking across dry land in the middle of a sea. Moses is a man that, that leads the people of Israel for 40 years in the land of wilderness. He's the man that God would touch in a mighty way to use in the Old Testament. He's a man who fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without food and without water because he was on top of a mountain called Sinai in the very presence of Almighty God. He was a man who brought down two tablets of stone from the presence of God to the congregation of Israel that was labeled now as the Ten Commandments. He was a great man used of God. He not only wrote this psalm, but wrote the first five books of the Bible. So when you read Genesis, when you read Exodus, when you read Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, we find that Moses was the human penman. With all that in mind, I want you to realize that, that this is a man that God touched in a great way. And as we look at this passage, we will discover some lessons learned in life by the man we call Moses. Now, before we move further, God really began to speak to me in this psalm. And I wrote down this thought. And if you don't walk away from the service without anything else, I want you to leave with this thought. And I hope that you'll make this thought your purpose in life. My life story will be used for God's glory. My life story will be used for God's glory. Will you come with me this evening as we travel through this psalm to discover three specific lessons that we can learn in this thing we call life? I believe that this psalm teaches us in verses 1 through 6 and 9 through 12 this great lesson. God is eternal and man is temporal. I believe in verses 7 and 8 we discover a second lesson. God is perfect and man is imperfect. And then verses 13 through 17 I believe we learn this lesson. God is all-knowing and man is not 
all-knowing. Will you come with me as we travel through this passage? Look at verses 1 through 6 and 9 through 12. In these portions, I wrote down this great lesson that we have to realize God is eternal, man is temporal. Notice verse number, number 2. The Bible says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I was reminded of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Have you ever wondered what existed before that statement? Well, God existed, and that was all. Because God is eternal. He never had a beginning, and He never has an ending. So when the skeptics raise the question, who created God, they are assuming that God is a created being. And since God is eternal, He cannot be created, and He does not have a beginning. Notice, I was also drawn to John chapter 1, verse 1, when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking of Jesus Christ, and this verse in John chapter 1 literally implies, as Pastor English would, would say time and time again while he was preaching here, that the term was in that text in John chapter 1, all it means is was and was and was and was and was, and you just keep going, etc., etc., that Jesus Christ was God, and He always was God. And He always will be God. And we have to keep that in mind in this life, that God is eternal. Man is temporal. As I was reading through this passage, I, I wrote down this as I was thinking about God is eternal, man is temporal. Life is brief. Life is brief. Our lifetime, as this psalm reveals, it may last 70 to 80 years. And there's some occasions where some people live to be well over a hundred years, as in Moses' case. And then before the flood in the book of Genesis, we find people lived way longer than that because of the atmosphere. But here in this passage, as, as the flood has, has taken place, uh, the people of Israel have come, and they're with Moses traveling around the wilderness. And, and he's writing these words, and he says that our days are just about 70 to 80 years. In manner of eternity... It's just a drop in the bucket. It's so brief. I like what James says in the New Testament. He says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Now, many of you ladies and maybe some of you men like to cook. And if you take a boiling pot of water and you, you let that thing boil, you get up to about 212 degrees Fahrenheit, guess what's going to happen? It's going to boil and then the steam is going to start rising. The Bible likens our life to that steam. That, hey, it's just there for a brief moment and then it vanishes away. So think about that. Your life is short and death is sure. Eternity is long, so don't be wrong. Also, as I was meditating here in, the, in this passage, I, I wrote down, I, I looked at verse number four, and it says that a thousand years in God's sight is, is as but yesterday. I was reminded in the book of Peter where it says that a, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And all that verse in this verse in Psalm 90, verse, verse number four represents is that God is outside of time. And time that we think isn't like what God thinks. Time doesn't even matter in a sense to God. It's, it's just short. It doesn't last for eternity like God. As I was drawn to, to verse number 9, it says, it says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Many tales are told throughout life. We tell stories to kids. You know, you watch these movies, you know, about Robin Hood and about all these different things. And, and you can summarize those stories in just a paragraph or a few words. And you know what's interesting? If you take open the newspaper or go on Google and type in the obituaries in Roanoke, Virginia, you'll find articles of people that are no longer a paragraph, and it summarizes their life. What's also interesting is you can walk to a cemetery like the cemetery right across the road here or some other cemetery in the Roanoke Valley and you'll walk up to the, to, to the grave and you'll see a tombstone. It'll have the individual's name, the date they were born, and the date that they left this earth. And it may have an epitaph. It may have a phrase or a statement that they thought was very special and characterized their life. But, but notice, notice now, all that's there is a dash. And that little dash represents the life that was lived. 
and here in Psalm 90 in James chapter 4 and many other places in the scriptures the Bible takes note that life is brief life is so short so let's live it for God Almighty I also want to draw your attention to verse 10 where it talks about the days of our years three score years and ten three score one score is 20 years so three score means 60 years uh, three score is going to be uh, you know 60 uh, and then so 60 70 80 years he's saying here that three score years and ten so 60 to 70 maybe even four score years up to 80 years Throughout that lifetime, however long uh, somebody lives or however short somebody lives, check it out what the verse says. It says, in this life, there's going to be strength, there's going to be labor, so we're going to have times that we're going to have to work, and listen, to be quite frank, we're going to have to work our butts off. We're going to have to sweat, we're going to have to get dirty, and we're going to have to clean out and scrub those toilets in life. But it also says, and sorrow. Life, the longer you live the more sorrow you're going to face. I go back to grade school in my mind, and the only time I was sorrow is if sorrowful is if, you know, I didn't get the piece of candy that I wanted, or if I didn't get to get a cheeseburger from McDonald's or get the chicken nuggets when I went. But as you live a little bit longer in life, you'll realize that sorrow changes, and it gets a lot more severe as the times go by. But then notice what it says, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So this life is going to be full of strength and labor and then sorrow. It's only going to last for a brief moment. As I was thinking about this thought, God is eternal and man is temporal, I did write down life is brief, but I also wrote down live for eternity. Notice what verse 12 says. Moses is writing, he's praying to God. And he's lifting up his voice to Almighty God here in this text. And he's probably thinking about many different things that he's done and experienced in his life. But he says here in verse number 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The greatest thing we could ever do is live our life for the glory of God. And I wrote down, live for eternity. Every day that we live, live for eternity. Make sure that we keep our focus and our sight on Jesus Christ and about sharing and declaring His gospel message. Because that's what this life is all about. Hey, the, the C.T. Stud, I believe, is the one who said, "'Tis one life shall soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last." So think about those words. How else would you want to live your life? Yes, you know, you could do a lot of things in this life. And no matter what field of occupation you choose or how God leads you, you can still live it for the glory of God. Not everybody's calling is to be a preacher. Not everybody's calling is to be an evangelist or a missionary. Not everybody's calling is necessary to be a deacon or necessarily a Sunday school teacher. But I believe everybody's calling of God is to share the message found in this book about Jesus Christ. So how can we live for eternity? Share the gospel. Live the gospel and share it in a Christ-like manner. Hey, the first lesson that we learn as we look at this psalm, I believe, is this. God is eternal. Man is temporal. Keep that in focus. God is forever. He doesn't have a beginning, and He doesn't have an ending. But man, we had a beginning to our life, and sooner or later, our life will come to an end. But I also want to draw your attention to verses 7 and 8. And now, let me say, before we move forward... God really began to speak to me as I was dealing with this text and meditating here. And these two verses hit us all. I wrote down this as I was reading verses 7 and 8. God is perfect. Man is imperfect. God is perfect. Man is imperfect. That is the second lesson we can learn. 
Notice what the text says. It says, For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. So perhaps some commentators have said that when Moses is writing these words, he's praying, he's, he's perhaps looking back to when the people of Israel were underneath the bondage, and I mean the cruel bondage of the Egyptians. You read the book of Exodus, it starts out in chapter 1, that, that hey, Joseph died in Genesis 50, it moves over into Exodus chapter 1, and there rose up a Pharaoh, or a leader of the land, who didn't know Moses. And he looked out and saw that, hey, the people, these Hebrews have outnumbered us. There's so many of them. Well, we need to take care of that. We're going to put these boys and girls to work. And they began to put them to work so much that all the people of Israel started to hate it. Oh, they hated it because they were just slaves. And perhaps as Moses is writing, he's recalling some of these times when his own people, his blood and kin, were going through these troubled times. But notice what he says. He says in verse number 8, and here's where it really hits home and the rubber meets the road. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. I wrote down this thought as I was thinking about God is perfect, man is imperfect. Sin cannot be concealed from God. Sin cannot be concealed from God. Here, may I say something to you, to us all this evening? We can hide sin from one another. Sure. We can look one way, look the other way, make sure nobody's watching us, but God is watching. As we think about this character, hey, when we came and introduced the, the psalm, I talked about some of the great things Moses did, but may I draw your attention that, to know that, that, hey, even the man writing this psalm was imperfect like you and me. If you know anything about the book of Exodus, you find that in Exodus chapter 2, Moses is birthed, Moses is placed in a basket in a river, and then the Egyptian family finds him, and they eventually um, adopt him and raise him. And then as Moses begins to get older in Exodus chapter 2, he's walking around the streets of the city, and he sees an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, just taking advantage of him. And you know what Moses does? He does what a lot of us do. He looked one way. He looked the other way to make sure nobody was watching him. And he goes over to that individual. And you know what he does? He doesn't just beat him up and punch him. He killed the man. And then he took the man, and the Bible says that he hit him in the sand. But even though Moses thought nobody saw him, there was a God up in heaven who saw him, and then there were other individuals in that area that saw him do the same thing. And then Pharaoh heard about it, and you know what Moses did? He fled to another land. And the other land, he would eventually meet the individual that he would marry. And, but to make that long story short, we, we realize that sin cannot be concealed from God. I think about another time when Moses was leading the people of Israel. And listen, you've got to understand, if, if it, I've been reading the book of Numbers recently and the book of Exodus, and, and listen, you would have thought they were a Baptist church. Because they, when things weren't going their way, they were full of complaints and, and all the other things. So Moses and Aaron, they're out in, in, in the wilderness, and, and the people of Israel come up to Moses and Aaron, and they, they're just complaining, like complaining and complaining. They said, Moses, we have no food in this desert. We have no grapes. We have no pomegranates. We have no, no, no anything. We don't have dates. We don't have anything to eat or drink. No water, nothing. We should have just went back where we were. Wish we would have died a long time ago so we didn't have to put up with all this. And Moses and Aaron, they did any, the only thing they could do when something like that happens. They got down on their knees and they began to pray to God. And God told them what to do. God told Moses, I want you to go out and I want you to speak to the rock. And when you speak to the rock, water is going to come out. And so they go and if you read Numbers chapter 20, you'll find out that Moses spoke to the rock. And I'm going to fill in the blank here that this is not really, it's in the text, but it seems to be implied that, that Moses is speaking to the rock and nothing happened right away. And so he takes that, that rod and he smites the rock. And then the water comes out. Moses disobeyed God, and as a result, he was not allowed to go into the land of promise. Sin cannot be concealed from God. God is perfect, but please be reminded, man is imperfect. As I'm looking at Moses' life, I'm reminded of this thought. 
The perfect God uses imperfect man to accomplish His plan. The perfect God uses imperfect man to accomplish His plan. As I was reading verse number 8, I thought about sin cannot be concealed from God. But I also wrote down this. Sin can be confessed to God. Sin can be confessed to God. As I'm looking in this passage, I, I realize that, that here it says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Every sin that we've ever committed or ever will commit, God knows about. So there's no use in trying to hide it from Him. It even says our secret sins. So, so the sins that only you know about and I know about in my own life, you only know about your life that nobody else knows about, God knows. He knows all about it. And in Romans, the Bible says that He will judge the secrets of man. The Bible says that in Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 12 that those things that are said in darkness that nobody knows about will be revealed upon the rooftops. But as I was thinking about these things, I was reminded of 1 John chapter 1. Where it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm thankful there was a day in my life that, that I realized that, hey, I, I was a sinner and I, my eternal destination was going to be a terrible place, the Bible describes as hell. And I got down on my knees and I prayed and asked God to forgive me and I accepted by faith the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone to atone my sins. And since that day, no, I haven't lived a perfect life, and I won't live a perfect life, and neither will anybody else. But since that day, God has forgiven me of my past, present, and future sins. And today I can say with all assurance that the God that did that for me is a God that can do that for you too. And that's why it's urgent that we share the gospel with everybody that we come across, whether it's in a prison or whether it's in a foreign country or whether it's right here in our own community, so that others can know that, hey, even though we've sinned against a holy, righteous God and that there's sins in our life that nobody else knows about, God can forgive us of those sins. We learned some lessons in this psalm. The first lesson, God is eternal, man is temporal. We learn a second lesson, God is perfect, man is imperfect. But I want to draw your attention to verses 13 through 17. As we come through to the end of the psalm, I wrote down this third and final lesson. God is all-knowing. That means He's omniscient. God is all-knowing. Man is not all-knowing. God is all-knowing. Man is not all-knowing. <laughs> One thing that I find it so funny about the independent Baptist movement is they're all right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> it, it amazes me that, that a preacher within our movement can stand up and declare something and say that it is the truth, even though... As you study some portions of Scripture, some things are not as black or white as one may, may reveal. But it is so funny that in our movement, you could go to a conference and one preacher will stand up and say one thing. And then another preacher will stand up and say something different. But they'll both say it as if it was the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All, all I, 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 I'm saying is this. Is that, hey, when we get to heaven... Please, don't crucify me. But the Baptists may not be right about everything when we get to heaven. Amen. And so, so keep that in mind. But I'll tell you one thing, that, that when we get to heaven, we'll find out that God was right about it all the whole time. Amen. So hey, just because there may be some areas that, that hey, I, I'll just be honest with you. I could take you to passages right now that I could share with you that I have not a clue what it means. But I'm sure that many of you here this evening are, 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 are Bible scholars and you have it all figured out. Hey. Um, did you hear about that one country preacher? He said, I got a Ph.D. I preach hell, fire, and damnation. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's beside the point. But here we find that, that hey, we, we don't know it all. 
And here, the, Moses is looking back and he says, God, you remember the past that you, that you brought us through? And now we're looking to the future? Hey, God knows our past, present, and future. So let's leave it all in his hands. God knows about the past that we've lived. God knows the present that we are living in. And God knows our future. So let's leave it all to him. Notice what it says in verse 15. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the evil years wherein we have seen evil. As I was meditating here, I wrote down yes. I wrote down God knows our past, present, and future. But I also wrote down this. And this is is so encouraging. God can turn our past failures into future successes. God can turn our past failures into future successes. I'm thankful that before God called Moses to lead the people out of Israel, He saw a man who did something that many of us, quite frank, most likely won't do. And that's murder somebody. And I'm glad that, that when God looks on mankind and he, he says, hey, I want to use this individual, it doesn't matter what that person's done in his past. God says, I want to use them, and I want to use them for my glory. Hey, so it doesn't matter if somebody's been strung out on cocaine. It doesn't matter if somebody's um, murdered as many people as Adolf Hitler. God can take that life, change it with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and use it for His glory. So, hey, too many times I'm guilty of trying to drive my car by the rear view mirror. And too many times... I'm guilty of just trying to look in the mirrors and as I'm driving in the car instead of being focused on the road. We get distracted in all areas. But I'm here to tell you something. In life, you know how we try to live our lives? We try to live our lives by looking behind us and looking constantly in the rearview mirrors. But may I say something today? It's far better to look through the windshield of life than look through the rearview mirror of life. And it doesn't matter what you've done. God can use it and change it for His glory. So be encouraged today that God can turn your past failures into future successes. As we come to a close and as we think about this passage, we're thinking about a man named Moses who thousands of years ago is writing these words. And I don't know where he was, but he was probably somewhere in his prayer closet and he just got out the writing utensil, whatever he was using, and, the, and whatever type of paper, papyrus he was using, whatever it was. And he just began to write down this prayer. And he's writing, and he's writing. And this happened all thousands of years ago. And he's just writing down these words. And it's so amazing how God, in His sovereignty, can reach down and take a man's prayer inspire those words and make it Holy Scripture for us to take and learn from. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Life is just a tale that is told. How will you, you your, how will you use yours? My life story will be used for God's glory. Father, we